This is a beer from my favorite brewery here in Nashville. One of my other loves in life besides guitar and music is craft beer. If you're ever in Nashville and you're a real hop head like me, you must go to Bearded Iris Brewing Company. They make the best IPAs I've ever had. This is an Imperial IPA with Talus, Idaho 7, and Citra hops. It's called Impressionist. And there's the segue. Impressionism was a 19th century art movement mainly central to France. The style was characterized by small brush strokes that were clearly visible, and the subject matter was usually of an everyday sort. There was usually a focus on accurately depicting light and movement and the passage of time. You could almost describe it as fleeting images. The images are clear, but there's a sort of inexplicit quality to them. Case in point, Claude Monet's Impression Sunrise, from which the term Impressionism originated following a satirical review of the works of Monet and his contemporaries. When you look very closely at these paintings, there's not much to see. All the brush strokes are very visible. The image only becomes clear when you consider the whole thing. Now, if you ever study the history of Western Eurocentric music, one thing that stays consistent is that pretty much every movement in the visual arts has an equivalent movement in music. And when we put years on art movements, the music movements typically start a number of years after the start of their counterparts in the visual arts. Impressionist art was at a high point in the 1870s, 1880s, Impressionist music was more 1890s, early 1900s. Impressionist music shared similar artistic goals as those of Impressionist painters, or at least they shared the same general artistic spirit. There was a focus on conveying moods and general feelings rather than being directly explicit, trying to represent the human experience. This was in stark contrast to a lot of the later Germanic Romantic composers like Wagner or Mahler, who were all about big, giant, epic orchestration. The two biggest names in Impressionist music are Claude Debussy and Maurice Ravel, although neither of them were particularly fond of the term Impressionist. Not really unusual. Artistic styles and genres of music are often named by critics or those on the outside, kind of like how Billy Joe Armstrong hates the term pop punk. So what exactly goes into composing Impressionist music? What makes it a distinct style? Among many things, there are compositional devices and approaches that set it apart from the tonally driven music of the larger European tradition. We'll look at a few things that Debussy was known for in particular. Whole tone scales. A whole tone scale is exactly what it sounds like. It's a scale where the interval between every pair of notes in the scale is a whole tone. It only has six notes in it, which cycle back to the octave. One of the interesting things about it is that you can't perceive any scale degree as the tonic or the root of the scale. How can you if it's all whole tones? None of the notes point to any of the others. This means that in an actual musical situation, it doesn't provide any direction. If you're going to associate some emotion or feeling with it, it's like being suspended in air. There's an uncertainty because it's not really taking us anywhere, but at the same time, it's very at home in its own space. It's like saying, here we are, but where are we? This quality is very much in the spirit of Impressionism. It's like a vague mood. Parallel harmonies. Debussy was also known to employ parallel harmonies in his music. If we're thinking broadly in terms of tonal music, the typical conventions are sort of anti-parallel motion. Contrary motion is a much more desirable sound, and it's typically richer and more dimensional. Contrary motion is when multiple melodic lines are opposing each other. One line is ascending while another is descending. But those independent melodic lines together form chords when we verticalize them. Really, chords are just multiple melodies happening simultaneously and working together, and Debussy was aware of this. Except in his case, he was less concerned about implying a specific tonal center in the chords he chose, and instead would often string together a bunch of root position diatonic chords in strict parallel motion. In later works, he started to go even further with chromatic parallel chords. Sure, he was rejecting established conventions by doing this, but what musical effect does this have? Well, it's similar to the whole tone scale. By stringing together, say, a bunch of minor seventh chords voiced exactly the same way, it lacks direction because it ignores any functional implications it may carry. Even stepping through root position diatonic triads would ignore any function. 
Just in general, a minor seventh chord going down a fifth to a dominant seventh chord would be a typical common expected motion because that's just how functional harmony works. But if function is ignored and we instead think of it as just melodies moving together without any particular destination, you get something that's less function and more color. Extended pedal points. A pedal point is when you have a sustained or repeated note around which other parts of the music continue to move. This is a very old technique. The term for it comes from Baroque organ music, where the organist may hold their foot down on one of the pedals to sustain a long note while continuing to play contrapuntal stuff in the hands. But it's not exclusive to organ music. It can be done in any configuration of instruments. This technique is important in impressionist music. If you consider parallel chords and whole tone scales, those things have no tonal center. But impressionists were not atonal composers. The thing that often gave this music a tonal center was the use of pedal points. If you play a bunch of atonal stuff over the top of a sustained note, that sustained note is going to carry a lot of weight. That's going to sound like home. Tone color. There's this flowery notion that music is like painting over silence or painting with sound. In the case of Impressionist music, this idea is more literal. Obviously not literal literal, but closer to. Ravel's Bolero is a famous example of something that relies heavily on tone color. It's a piece for orchestra that only contains a couple repeated melodies. Just by that description, one would expect it to be incredibly boring. And to be fair, many do find it to be very boring. But Ravel keeps it interesting by passing the melodies around to different instruments, and he harmonizes it at different intervals, so we hear it with a wide variety of sonic colors over the course of the piece. But in Impressionist music, even scales and chords were chosen for their sonic colors, not for their musical function. Color is the name of the game in Impressionism. Colors and evoking moods with them. Musical function is hard to get away from. It's so ingrained in the conventions of our Western musical language that to do what composers like Debussy and Ravel did with any success, you need to first understand the rules you're endeavoring to break. I mean, really, there are no rules, and you can pretty much do anything you want in music, but we do have a collective understanding of what works, whether we pick up on it intuitively or we understand it explicitly. These things can be easily boiled down to pure mechanics. And to break away from them, you really need to know what it is you're breaking away from. These guys certainly did. So I hope you enjoyed this video. I have a new video out every Thursday. At the time of recording, I have some openings for private Zoom students. If that's something you're interested in, feel free to reach out to me. As always, thank you for watching, and I will see you next week.